Good evening, good afternoon, good Abend, and since we're in Bavaria, Grüß Gott. Dear members of the PrEP Steering Committee, dear PrEP participants, your participant list reads like a who's who in the German and US museum scene, and it is a singular honor for me to welcome you here at, in, in Munich at the America House today for your fourth meeting, international meeting. After New York, Berlin, and Los Angeles, PrEP brings you now to Munich. As the former capital of the movement and the post-war location of the central collecting point, a very fitting choice. Munich is confronting its own past head on. The opening of the iconic NS Documentation Zentrum in 2015 can attest to that. In the next week, you will be all over the Munich Kunstareal, or Art District. What a fantastic program the prep coordinators have put together. But I don't know, maybe it was by choice, but I think the prep coordinators make, made one big mistake. You missed Oktoberfest. <laughs> maybe that was on purpose. <laughs> Let me mention that in Germany, we at the consulate often encounter a great amount of gratitude for what the monuments men have done. For example, when John Skilton almost single-handedly saved Giovanni Battista Tiopolo's world-famous ceiling fresco, Allegory of the Planets and Continents, at the Würzburg residence. I myself marveled at the fresco when I accompanied our deputy chief of mission in Würzburg last year. It's an amazing story. No screenwriter of Hollywood could have invented a character so right for the role Skilton played in rescuing Tiopolo's Teop masterpiece for posterity. He collected the logs to replace the roof. He floated them down the Mine River and personally financed a sawmill to cut the logs. And working with his German counterparts, they constructed that roof that saved that fresco. What a stroke of serendipity to have an art historian in the US military at the right place and at the right time of history. Rightfully, a room in the residence is now dedicated to Monuments Man John Skilton. Through films like Monuments Men and Women in Gold, provenance has found its way into pop culture. People talk about it. People have an understanding of it. Perhaps a double-edged sword, but something the public is now very interested in and often very appreciative of those concerted efforts. The work that all of you do is so important for now and for history. Decades after being looted, thanks to your efforts, cultural property is still being returned to its rightful owners, or in some cases, their heirs. Justice has no expiration date. And new findings continually to constantly change the field. Transnational cooperation is so important in many fields today, and particularly in the field of provenance. And this was also struck to me when I spoke with, with Jane from the Smithsonian, about how this exchange has really led to a lot of research and a lot of new understanding and new thinking in this important field. So I applaud you for bringing together German and US experts in this forum. All of you made the extra effort to walk the last three feet to actually meet something we call people to people diplomacy. Nothing can adequately, bless you, nothing can adequately replace these face-to-face -face encounters. You are also helping to adjust provenance to the 21st century requirements by offering online platforms for continued exchange and other state-of-the-art solutions, also very, very important for the future of this field. With that, I wish you a very productive exchange over the coming days. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear colleagues, a very warm welcome also from my side. I'm Uri Pfisterer, director of the Zentralinstitut für Kunstgeschichte in Munich. 
having 13 guests from the US and 13 participants from Germany, plus the steering committee of the PrEP in Munich, all from different institutions, and having such a rich program from the monuments mean past and present, from questions of how to manage collections and deal with public expectations to challenges of current and future transnational prominence research, is an important moment for us, for the history and for the future, future research agenda of the Central Institut. Please allow me to focus briefly on just three aspects which make this event so important for us and which I believe are and will become even more crucial for dealing with all questions of art and cultural her heritage and specifically for dealing with the burden of Nazi crimes. Firstly and most obviously, and we've already heard that Munich and the Central Institut have a special historical responsibility. The foundation of the Central Institut in 1946-47 resulted not only from one of the central art collecting points of the Allies and one of the operational bases for the monuments main in Germany, but also signals with its name Central Institut the descendants from these central art collecting points. Moreover, PrEP corroborates and enriches in an important way the other prominence activities which the Central Institute is involved with other partner institutions, is involved in with other partner institutions. I just mentioned the Winter School we have organized in 2016 in collaboration with the Forschungsverbund Provenienzforschung Bayern or the Zertifikatskurs Provenienzforschung for which the ZI is a partner of the FU Berlin and the Landesstelle für die Nichtstaatlichen Museen Bayern. What becomes immediately evident from these short remarks is that provenance research, or at least good provenance research, has to be a collaborative effort where different institutions, different resources, and different expertises have to come together. This might sound trivial in our context, However, it is not for art history in a broader sense where the splitting up of the discipline into two or even more different art histories of the universities and the museums has been a growing challenge since the late 1990s. The program of this prep meeting, therefore, seems to me an exemplary model for art history in general for how to work beyond self-imposed boundaries and a demonstration of how museums, research institutions, universities, and the art market can most productively work together. It is our aim to develop the Central Institute into a place which offers such a common ground for discussion to the supposedly different subfields of art history and to the different interests and theoretical positions of all disciplines interested in cultural heritage, the visual, and the aesthetic. I'm also very pleased that the program of this afternoon and the following days brings together senior researchers of various disciplines and methodological approaches with younger scholars still working on their dissertations. And thirdly, this meeting opens up the focus of provenance research beyond the Nazi era. The challenges of provenance research have no chronological or geographical limits. They directly lead to the overarching questions of art history and cultural heritage. And one of the central requirements for future research probably lays in the balancing of a highly specialized and specific research and these broader perspectives on art, culture, and the historical and systematic ways humans deal with artifacts and art. I would like to close by thanking the Bayerische Amerika Academy and the NS Dokumentationszentrum for the excellent collaboration here in Munich, as well as the organizing institutions of PrEP, the Smithsonian Institution Washington, and the Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz Staatliche Museen zu Berlin. A special thanks goes to my colleague Christian Fuhrmeister and the ZE team for making this happen. As the work and discussions have already started since yesterday evening, I can only wish us all a most productive continuation. Hello, I will start my talk by saying I am not Lynn Nicholas. <laughs> Um, uh, Lynn Nicholas, as you all know, um, is the author of The Rape of Europa, um, uh, a seminal book that was published in 1994, the first edition. 
And um, it was an awakening for us all, and certainly in the US um, and uh, before the Washington principles came about. Um, Lynn came and was very looking forward to giving this talk and participate um, to prep this week. But uh, And she also said she never in her life uh, broke a commitment. But upon arriving in Munich, she fell um, and broke her nose and um, didn't feel up to it. So she flew back. Um, so uh, I am very humbly going to read her paper. Um, she conducted this research in the 1980s, and um, will, which will become very clear um, as I read her text. And um, I was in high school uh, and, or in college at the time. So, um, but she was definitely a trailblazer. Um, and again, this is Lynn's voice. When I say I, imagine Lynn. <laughs> All right, so let's see. A little more than 50 years ago, I, Lynn, was hired to do a special project for the then director of the National Gallery of Art, John Walker, who appears on the left on this slide. I did not know it at the time, but I was surrounded by what we now call monuments men and those who had chosen them and supported their efforts during and after the war. Little did I know that in the files of the gallery and in the National Archives building across the street were miles of archives and millions of the photographs that are now so well known, such as this famous one or that one with a Cranach and a Rubens, and that from the basis uh, and, uh, that form the basis of our ever expanding knowledge of the art world in the Nazi era. At that time, the exploits of the Monuments Man and of the Nazi looters were not on anybody's screen. Indeed, nobody had screens at the time. This Lynn is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> The only way to see a document was to find it in the miles of files, and you had to copy the information by hand. There were copy machines in some places, but uh, you had to plot and scheme to get any time to use those machines. You had to sign up and uh, bring many coins, and usually you had to pay an exorbitant sum for copies that may never have arrived. The extraordinary work that the Monuments Man had done was not forgotten, but it was considered complete and over with by all involved. And the world had moved on to face the Cold War and the rebuilding of Europe, not an easy task. And no one was quite sure of just what there was behind the Iron Curtain. There was a lot. The history of the Holocaust was still being discovered and written, and there was so very much more that my generation of history students did not yet know. In 1979, I, Lynn, moved to Brussels with my family, and the next year I happened to read the obituary of Rose Vallon, the leg legendary heroine of the French Resistance, who it said had been instrumental in recovering some 60,000 works of art looted from France by the Nazis. I had worked in a museum long enough to know that 60,000 works is a lot. <laughs> the National Gallery of Art, opened by Franklin Roosevelt in 1941, for example, had less than 4,000 works at the time. Um, here are shown the uh, blockbuster show in 1948 of the famous 202 works brought from Berlin to DC um, to save them from the Russians and the Rubens that you could see in that photo. When I, Lynn, asked museum people in Belgium about Vallon, they said, yes, of course, the looting was huge, the restitution equally so, and you, don't you know Peter Pericott? Uh, hold on, Pericott, James Warimer, and Mason Hammond, John Nicholas Brown, Carter Brown, etc. Actually, I did know them, she says, and so my research began. 
as was true of most World War II veterans in the US. These men, like George Stout, had done their jobs and saved tons of Europe's art for posterity and then gone back. And for the most part, this is Dean Keller, um, continued the careers in the art world that they had had to leave when they were drafted or volunteers to join the armed forces. But they had left behind voluminous records. They were required to take pictures and keep diaries, and many also had conducted fascinating private correspondence outside regular channels, which was much more revealing than the official records, but was often hard to find, as it was still held by the families or had been deposited in an array of archives and libraries. As you will hear in a few moments, the placement and choice of these men in the positions they eventually held in the war zones was not a coincidence. There was extensive preparation both in the US and Europe for the salvage and protection of monuments and works of art. The Frick Art Research Library turned over its entire operations to the cause and created maps like this. Dealers were recruited to make lists, for instance, George Wildenstein. Art professionals like Paul Sachs of Harvard and Francis Henry Taylor of the Met were very aware of the dangers to such treasures and in those days wrote letters to each other about it. But getting politicians and the military to pay attention was another matter. Meanwhile, art historians and dealers in Germany, as was required by the Nazi regime, were also making lists of foreign co co collections sorry, and dealers, like the famous Kummer report. Hold on, I'm trying to trace because it's mixed up. Um, unjustly removed from Germany in, um, I don't know what she's saying. Anyway, there's something about the Kent altar. It's as an example. I am glad to say that efforts to provide similar information to um, present um, to present day military entities has continued. The Blue Shield organization, for example, worked to protect and salvage things damaged in the Bosnian war. Such as Bridge. And training programs for the US military go on at the Smithsonian and elsewhere in the US, and it's still going on. There was thus plenty of material to look at when I began. In the United States, access to most of the records was not really an issue. Over 50% of the relevant records were never classified, and, and an executive order of 1972 ordered the mass declassification of the rest, a task that was almost totally completed by 1982. But you had to find out where they were. The finding aids were minimal, and many things were in remote storage warehouses with no food or drinks available. It would also take a long time to recognize that the records in every country of agencies such as finance ministries, customs, lists of imported, exported and sequestered objects, immigration, police and intelligence agencies were often also relevant and these were much less open. It would also become clear that as the lawyers of the onion, layers, sorry, of the onion um, were peeled away, that coordination with European records was essential, and these were at that time far less accessible than American ones. And so began my many days in the belly of the archives, and this is a picture of the National Archives in Washington, D.C. This sedate, classical-looking building is very deceptive. Inside, there are some 20 floors of shelves crammed full. Stacks of paper overflowed on the floors. The floors are connected inside by rather nice wrought iron spiral staircases. By the way, none of us have seen those because now those collections are at College Park in Maryland. Sometimes it was spooky. When I began, amazingly, researchers could work in certain areas of the stacks. And there are always the incredible archivists who knew where everything was. 
I re remember saying to one of them, I wish I could find a letter from Eisenhower that shows he approved such and such an action, to which the archivist replied, oh, well, that would be in record group, blah, blah, in box so-and-so, and it was. So day after day, I would go downtown and look through piles of old papers, which still included the original German document signed by Goering, Posse, or Hitler, and many more. They all used different color colored pencils for their annotations, a detail lost in black and white microfilm. I loved it. I learned how to procure my time uh, on the copying machines and how to collate items chronologically so they began to tell a story. And as we all know now, it was pretty amazing. To this was added the invaluable fact that I was privileged to meet, interview and correspond with so many of the monuments men. Lane Faison, who did the main report on the Linz collection, was an important mentor, as was Craig Smythe, director of the Munich Collecting Point, and many others like Edith Standen, who later worked at the Met. Their stories were the stuff of Indiana Jones, complete with booby-trapped caves, evil Nazi barons, beautiful but possibly suspect central collecting point secretaries, she didn't explain, <laughs> gruff MPs and magnificent works of art being transported in the back of jeeps through mud and dark forests, perfect for a movie, which you will also hear about in a few moments. I have a hard time picturing Lynn <laughs> looking for a picture of George Clooney. <laughs> <laughs> Today, the basic history of the looting and early recovery of national and private treasures is pretty well, well known, and we are now in a different era of research. Now we must determine if seals were voluntary or forced. Here's the, the good man smokestacks. Who are the proper heirs and which nation's law apply? Laws. We must, we must deal with conflicting agendas, consider the national or public interest to be fair to both claimants and good faith owners, whose relations are often but need not always be uh, adversarial. Uh, there are many variants and nuances that must be made clear and applied to these cases that are best dealt with individually. Not to be Trumpian, but a global solution cannot be fair in the area of restitution, despite the fact that global sources must be brought to bear. And one thing has not and will not change the need to find accurate information and use it objectively. We're way beyond the sensational automatic mass repatriations of a castle or a mine full of, of obvious loot. And then she had a list of slides. And so I'm just reading Florence, Neuschweinstein, um, the Rothschild jewels, the Hunger books, the Polish church treasures, Goering's train, and the bombing of books. Now we are well into a whole industry that revolves around rather fluid concepts of restitution and that has expanded to include many other categories of objects such as Native American artifacts and the spoils of the colonial eras. As you will hear in the next days, the tools for the discovery of information have been exponentially transformed by technology in the last 20 or 25 years, and a new profession, that of provenance researcher, has been established, for which meetings such as this one, so generously supported by both German and American institutions and governments, provide extraordinary opportunities to exchange information. I, Lynn, would like to note that much of this effort began right here in Munich in the darkest, darkest of post-war years when the representatives of the greatest art institutions of both allies and Axis came together in peace to achieve their common goal, to save some of the greatest works produced by humanity for posterity, an effort for which many on both sides had already risked their lives. The conditions were terrible, but chaos soon gave way to order. And then she says, here are a few reminders. 
the Allied Monuments Man at the Munich Central Collecting Point, the Loading Dock at the Munich Central Collecting Point, Munich Central Collecting Point before, and after. Munich Central Collecting Point of the um, Goring's loot from Naples with a Brogel and a Titian. Um, another picture of the collecting point and a picture of Rose Vallon with Edith Stenden at the Munich Central Collecting Point with um, um, uh, part of a Rodin sculpture. That's it. My name is Esther Haya, and the following 7.5 minutes, I would like to give an insight into one of my core questions concerning the cases of Rose Vallon and Franziskus Count Wolf Metternich. Why are these people subject of today's discourse? What do they stand for? Who were they and what did they do before World War II, during the war and in the afterwar period? They are connected by their work for the preservation of cultural heritage, a subject that standing for its own already implies several conflicting aspects of national interests, politics and personal ambitions. But even if personal interests of German, French, American and English art historians and colleagues might have been subordinate in the interest of national heritage protection for each individual, these protagonists acted controlled by different motives of war, nationality, politics, and propaganda. Even nowadays, when those protagonists were rediscovered, they are being used as human protection screens of national heroism. This leads to the question, a need for heroes. Robert Etzel's book is titled Monuments Man, Allied Heroes, Nazi Thieves and the Greatest Treasure Hunt in History. The monuments, fine arts and archives section officers thereby are already entitled as heroes, which every detail in Clooney's film The Monuments Man emphasizes and thereby the caption Monuments Man states the hero, going from the archives to Hollywood. As honorable, the effort and intentions of those MFAA officials should be considered. The support of their aim to save cultural heritage was not that heroic. The support from the military was the contrary. They were left with not enough money, no materials and authorizations in their division. In the motion picture, there's only one woman in Paris with expert knowledge. In this case, the writers felt that they had to add a small love triangle to her character to make her even more mysterious. Rose Valland was a French art historian. Recently, she was much noticed as a French spy that secretly recorded the details in the Nazi plundering of artworks, especially Jewish-owned collections, and thereby saved thousands of objects. She was born in 1898, studied art and art history in Lyon and Paris. In 1932, she became volunteer assistant curator at the Chaux de Pont. During World War II and German occupation in Paris, Rose Vallon was put in paid service and became supervisor at the Jeux de Pomme, where units of the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, ERR, had a headquarter and central storage for looted artworks, which have been distributed from there to several depots and collections in Germany. Vallon secretly recorded names of artworks, collectors and destination places, information she could deliver to the di director of the Musée National, Jacques Jojard, who was connected to the Resistance and helped sabotage some transports to Germany. The pursuit of the last train leaving Paris in August 1944 was inspiration for John Frankenheimer's film The Train in 1964. After the liberation of Paris, Rose Vallon became member of the Commission de Récupération Artistique, the French unit for the recovery of artworks, and lived in Germany, mainly Berlin, until 1954. She was then named Chef du Service de Protection des œuvres d'art and kept working for the protection of French works of art even after retiring in 1968. Her autobiography, about her work at the Chaux de Pomme was published in 1961, titled Le Front de l'Art. She received several honors, and a tremendous number of documents she wrote and collected are preserved in French archives and are essential for today's provenance research. However, in her lifetime, she hardly was known as the great hero we can find in today's films, literature, and even comic and children's books. 
Franziskus Count Wolf Metternich was born in 1893 as the youngest child of a Catholic and Francophile aristocratic family in the Rhineland near Cologne. He served during World War I and completed his study, studies in art history in Bonn 1923. He was a student of Paul Clemen, who was responsible for the Kunstschutz, the protection of cultural heritage in World War I. And in 1928, Wolf Metternich became his successor as leading monument conservator in the Prussian province Rhineland and later started teaching at the University of Bonn. So when in May 1940, Wolf Metternich became head of the Kunstschutz, he already was a well-known conservator and protagonist in cultural life. Wolf Metternich's position as a director of the Kunstschutz is well known, but still his role, personal and political interests, as well as his commitment for the protection of art in France is not clear and regarded ambivalent in current state of research. Since 2013, the family archives contain Wolf Metternich's private papers and a great written record of the Kunstschutz an important source of archival material, which is the main subject of a current archival research project. As a member of a strict Catholic aristocratic family in the Rhineland and with his career as conservator for the protection of cultural heritage, he could easily connect with nobility in Belgium and France, just as part of his staff in France was titled too. In July 1940, Wolf Metternich arrived, arrived in Paris and the Kunstschutz section was installed within the military government. Having trouble with the confiscation of Jewish collections and controversies with the ERR, the powers of Wolf Metternich were quickly cut down, and main topic became the safekeeping of French national collections, depots and castles, and thereby a collection with Jacques Chaujard, director of the Musée National, began. This collaboration, or even functional friendship, of Chaujard and Wolf Metternich is one of the main storylines in the movie Francophonia of Russian director Alexander Sukhorov. An essay on cultural heritage, loss and ownership set in the Louvre, where Napoleon and La Liberté themselves argue and a friendship develops between Jojard and Wolf Metternich for the greater good of the preservation of cultural heritage. This connection to Jojard and colleagues among the following collaboration and Sorry, this connection to Joja and the colleagues, along with the following collaboration with American and British MFAA officers, was crucial for Wolf Metternich in the post-war period, especially during the time of denazification and re-establishment of cultural exchange and the reactivation of networking. Many of those who were regarded as heroes and casually said that they fought for the good thing, made a significant career in the post-war period. As to say, Wolf Metternich switched to the Department of Foreign Affairs and was the leader of the cultural department 1950 to 52. He tried to enter a position in the German embassy in Rome and in 1953 became director of the reopened Bibliotheca Herziana, a Max Planck Institute for Art History in Rome. Until his death in 1978, he was a main contact for monument preservation. In the 1950s, both Wolf Metternich and Valland took part in the proceedings for the UNESCO Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the, in the event of armed conflict. And both, as well as several MFAA officers, were honored with medal of the French Légion d'honneur. Wolf Metternich even before Valland which emphasizes the question of women in this discourse one more time. <laughs> Concluding with a critical look on those biographies of impressive and courageous people without glorifying and judging, we need to have in mind who those people were, where they came from, nationality, cultural context, political system, family and personal interests to follow their actions and networks and realize how they were and still are used as human protection screens for several interests. As well as today, we have to recognize our own interest in research and how information and the staging of potential heroes, offenders, victims and spies is used in the media and scientific discourse. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Laura Nikolajczuk and I'm a PhD candidate at the Ludwig Maximilians University. To begin with, I would like to thank my supervisor, Mr. Vormeister, for giving me the opportunity to present my research before such a respected audience. 
During the next seven minutes, I will display how digital techniques and sources are part of my dissertation project. Allow me to outline a general overview first. Yes. The core objective is to examine the so-called Harvard lists and Frick maps, preliminary works compiled by members of the American Defense Harvard Group and the American Council of Learned Societies. Two civilian groups who were engaged in the duty of art protection months before the Roberts Commission was installed in August 1943. Furthermore, their work built a firm base for the work of the Roberts Commission and the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives section, as well as for soldier guides and manuals. The great appeal of the achievements of the Monuments Men and its vivid recognition in recent scholarship and popular media has, however, overshadowed the important role of the Harvard Group and the ACLS. The topic of my investigation is therefore intended to fulfill a desideratum of research. These so far unpublished lists and maps form a complete catalogue of Europe's visual cultural heritage. They aimed at assisting the military and consequently supporting the work of the MFANA. In these lists, the monuments were divided by city or region. Within the group, each monument was rated by its significance, a range from none to four stars, similar to the Bedeka guides. To condense this, the aim of the thesis is on the one hand to reveal the complex structure of the civilian art protection services to chart their growth and development. On the other hand, the thesis compares and evaluates numerous unpublished sources in order to analyze the art historical methods of the individual scholars and the motivation of such groups, as well as to determine how each monument was seen to be relevant and how it was categorized and judged within cultural traditions in respect to art history, local citizens, and the military. The materials which need to be collected for this project are almost exclusively to be found in collections on the east coast of the US. The greater part of the records concerning the Roberts Commission, the Monuments Men, and its predecessors are held by the National Archives and Records Administration. Therefore, for three, an ancestry database providing access to NARA military records is a vital source. Full text search allows the user to filter an enormous number of typescripts. The page of each folder have been indexed using Optical Character Recognition, OCR. The matches are highlighted on the screen. Different tools such as common search operators and adjustments of the time span help to narrow down the results. Contrarily, the full text search finds all the occurrences of a text, even the irrelevant ones, and only the existing text is being detected but not synonyms. Instead of using full text search, the main browse tool in Fold3 is an alternate way to um, search the database. The browse tool allows the user to visually drill down folders and documents page by page. Although the database is a great help and everything is much more easier than before, there are also a few disadvantages to point out. Even entering different keywords will likely lead to the same lists of results. Fold3 does not show whether or not a user has already viewed documents and users are not able to pause, that is, interrupt their search and return to the same place the next day. The overall fundamental archival data work is the base of my subsequent step of a cartographic evaluation to create a visual compendium of the scholar's work and their methodology. It intends to become a comprehensive cartographic database and a foundation for future research. Therefore, ArcGIS, a geographic information system of ESRI, provides the required functions that will be used for building charts and maps, as well as common spreadsheet programs. The collected data taken from the Harvard lists and Frick maps, war version and amendments, the differing, different ordering schemes of the buildings and monuments are to be made visible on a map and compared to one another. At the core of this database, the various classifications of every single monument should be selectable to authenticate the scholar's work and to offer new insights through relations and their graphical representation. One of the possible results that the big data analysis can provide is that the visualization shows in which areas the agglomeration of higher valued art was th denser than to other areas. To give an example, a simple question might be, 
were more buildings being considered significant in Italy or Germany. In this regard, to compare which monuments are relevant, it is necessary to associate and analyze the lists and maps to in light of the different, differing academic literature and travel manuals which were published, published especially since the nation building of the late 19th century. To give another example, the Harvard Group's lists and maps of the ACLS will be visually juxtaposed to the target lists of the American task forces, an overview of buildings to be ranked in hostile territory. These directories have similar categorization schemes to the Harvard lists and maps. With the help of the GIS, a complete study should shed light on patterns, similarities and glaring differences. Were esteemed monuments present in the directories, were they as crucial to the military and how high were they ranked? Elements of digital humanities will not deliver all the answers to the questions that arose during research. But in addition to the two-dimensional material, such as the correspondence, memoranda, drafts and publications found in the archives, it is certain that the digit digital evaluation and visualization will form a comprehensive picture. It does not matter in this case if the data either confirms or opposes the assumptions, but that it refers to facts that require further investigation and explanation. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to answering your questions later on. Good evening. First, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here, join your conference. Yeah. Making Heroes, George Clooney's Monuments Man, seen from the perspective of a historian and provenance researcher. The historian and provenance researcher, that's me. My name is uh, Birgit Kirchmeier. I'm a historian and uh, associate professor at the Institute of Modern Contemporary History at the University of Linz. Let me start my talk with a few personal biographical remarks. It was 1996, so more than 20 years ago, and it was my first job as historian after having finished my studies. I did the historical research for a documentary movie called Sonderauftrag Linz, so on the topic of Hitler's uh, Planet Museum for Linz. An Austrian director, Andreas Gruber, he's now a professor here at the Filmhochschule München, he was planning this movie on the occasion of the so-called Mauerbach auction in Vienna, Austria. Maybe some of you remember. Hundreds of artworks, so-called Herrenlos, unidentified leftovers of the Munich collecting point, were stored in Mauerbach near Vienna for years, for decades. In 1995, these works of art were donated by the Austrian government to the Jewish community in Vienna and auctioned 1996 at Christie's. A few months later, in January 1997, two Schiele paintings of the Leopold collection were confiscated in New York as looted art. These two incidents can be considered as the start, or maybe the restart, as we will see, of restitution debates and provenance research in Austria. And in our documentary movie, which focused on the Linz Museum, we wanted to pick out some stories of looted artworks and their owners and follow them through the history. So I had to do a lot of research in archives and I was also searching for interview partners. The more I read, the more I found, the more I was fascinated by the topic, which was completely new to me at this time. Um, in the archives, I found interesting papers, records, so the reports from the American Art Looting Investigation Unit. One of these reports on the Linz Museum, which I was most interested in, was written by a man named S. Lane Faison Jr. You also, uh, you already heard about in the uh, talk of Lynn Nicholas. <laughs> so S. Lane Faison Jr. I read the report and thought, who, who is this man? Who was this man? Was he still alive? I wanted to find him for a movie. Please remember, it was the time before Google came into our lives and it was not too easy to find him. But fortunately at this time, first books on the topic were published, like the most important, The Rape of Europa by Lynn Nicholas. And first conferences took place, like Spoils of War in 1995 in New York. And one of the speakers there was Les S. Lane Faison, 
the man I was looking for. And that's the way I found him and I found out where he was living and we decided to go to the US for an interview with him. And this became my first personal experience with the former monument man. I will talk more about it a little bit later. I just have to add that it was not our documentary movie titled Sonderauftrag Linz, which was shown in Austrian TV in 1999 and also got a nice award called Romy. But I have to commit ungrudgingly it was George Clooney's film of 2013, The Monuments Man, based on the book of Robert Edsel, which brought The Monuments Man to a broader public. Historians and provenance researchers knew them for sure before, but Robert Edsel and George Clooney brought them to Hollywood and they made them heroes. My issue now is not um, a reality check between film and history. Film is film, history is history. So it's not my prior interest now to focus on what's right and wrong in the film, unless there were a lot of things you could mention, but that's another point. My interest is to focus on the crucial narratives in the movie and to compare them with the narratives one can find in the stories of the real monuments men. Let's start with the movie. First question is, how can you adapt or how to adapt a story which is quite complicated to the requirements of a Hollywood movie script? So I would say, there was a good starting basis, precious artworks, secrets, Nazis and brave American soldiers. Um, that's what Lynn Nicholas also told us. One of the most important tools getting the story more suitable for a movie was already given by Robert Edsel in his book. He took out the stories of eight individuals. He told the stories of eight soldiers, not of an anonymous mess. Um, they all have names, they have families, they have biographies. And in George Clooney's movie, they have other names, it's not the real names, but we can identify them. The brave and handsome Frank Stokes, featured by George Clooney himself. In real life, George Stout, you have already seen the photograph, who established the whole Monuments branch. Further, the young and bright James Granger, featured by Matt Damon and based on the model of MFAA officer James Rorimer. He had also a photograph. The smart Englishman Donald Jeffries, alias Ronald Balfour, and so on. We see them living, fighting, loving, suffering. History gets individual faces and fates. And along with this individualization, we can also consider in the movie a process of glorification of heroization. Die ungewöhnlichen Helden, that's the German subtitle of the movie, always stick together. They risk their lives not only for their comrades, but also for America and for the whole world and its cultural heritage. They are characters of high morality in all situations. Let me give you an example. Um, there's a wonderful scene with Officer James Granger, James Rorimer, who is married, and the French art historian Claire Simon, Rose Vallon, as we heard. And even though they are in Paris, Officer Granger resists the French appeal of Miss Simon. It was really just a small love scene in the movie, yeah? But even more important than this uh, matrimonial loyalty is the loyalty to the comrade. Uh, camaraderie can be considered as one of the most crucial topics of the movie. There are two scenes I would mention for that. First one shows the death of Lieutenant Jeffries. He was trying to save the Madonna of Bruges and was shot by a German soldier. By the way, although I didn't want to do that, this is historically not correct. <laughs> no one died by saving the Madonna of Bruges. But fact is, there were two monument officers who died in service. But back to the movie. Shortly after the death of um, monuments man Donald Jeffries, the troop was losing a second man. The French officer, Jean-Claude Clermont, was shot in a gunfire. These two incidents sow the narrative in the film mark the moment when the Monuments Men, a group of art historians, became soldiers, sharing a mission. And this mission was saving the arts and doing this job from now on in the name of their killed comrades. Let me show you the key scene, as I 
who would argue for that argument. Yeah, that's the key phrase, I think. And now we owe it to them to finish the job. Very pathetic, but as I think a typical war movie topic. More specific and maybe more interesting here for us is another narrative of the movie concerning the mission of the monument soldiers. So what was this mission exactly? Why did they risk their lives only, only for saving the arts? And why did they save the arts? For making spoils? No, the mission was to save arts and return it. We learn this in a scene of the movie which is settled in Paris. Officer Granger, based on the model of the monument man, second lieutenant James Rorimer, came to Paris and meets the French art historian Claire Simon, in real life, Rose Vallon. You know her story from the um, first speech. Uh, she was art historian in Chaux de Pont Museum. She worked for the German occupation, but as part of the uh, French resistance, and she gave important information and documents later on uh, about artworks stolen by Goering to the MFAA. After liberation of Paris, uh, Vallon was first arrested. In, in the following scene, you see the first encounter of Rose Vallon and uh, uh, MFA officer Rorima, so James Granger in the film. The actors are Kate Blanchett and Matt Damon. I love this scene. I think um, it's a dream of every provenance researcher <laughs> taking the picture, <laughs> looking for the address and return it. But nevertheless, it's, it's a really crucial scene for the uh, movie. My job is to find art and return it. The mission of the monuments man, and this is the master narrative of the film, is not only saving the art, but also returning the art. No spoils. Instead of that, restitution. And on this point, I want to compare the movie narrative with the, uh, with the memories of real monuments men, precisely with two interviews I made in the 1990s on the occasion of the documentary film Sonderauftrag Linz. We could speak then with Eslin Faison and with Greg U. Smythe. Both of them were playing an important role for Munich, for the Munich collecting point, which was established in spring summer 1945, not far away from this place in the former Verwaltungsgebäude der NSDAP, heute Zentralinstitut für Kunstgeschichte. Greg U. Smythe, naval officer and art historian with the Princeton degree, was the first director of the collecting point Munich in 1945. In 1986, he published the book Repatriation of Art from the Collecting Point in Munich after World War II. And he wrote there, quote, Stout and Lafarge stressed to me that the Munich Collecting Point must serve both for immediate safe storage and as a long-term repository and center for cataloging loot. End of the quote. The Munich Collecting Point was established as a repository for the artworks the monuments men have found in different places, uh, for example, uh, in the salt mines of Alto See in Austria. Hundreds of trucks brought thousands of artworks to Munich. So the point where George Clooney's film Monuments Man ends, that's when the monuments men reach Alto See, in the salt mine, is not the point where the work of the monuments men ended. <laughs> Quite on contrary. And for me, that's the crucial thing. Saving arts in wartime, the work of the monuments men in field, is neither new nor original. There were such efforts, for example, in World War I. But what happened in May 45 was new. The MFAA branch continued the work after war in Europe. And with the foundation of the art collecting points in Munich and other places, started a new period of their activities. The statement of Craig Smythe shows that the responsible persons were already at that point, at the end of the war in Europe, aware of a longer duration of their mission. And the mission now was identifying and returning arts. In other words, the mission was provenance research. The sources and tools they worked with were the same as today, studying catalogs, documents, papers. But there was also a branch interviewing people who were part of the looting network of the Nazis. 
the Art Looting Investigation Unit of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. One of their members was S. Lane Faison. As an art historian, he joined the unit in 45, and together with his colleagues, James Plott and Theodore Russo, he came to Alta See in May 1945 to do investigations on the Nazi art looting organizations and to interview Nazi officials who had been uh, detained by Western Allied forces. I want to show you a small extract of the interviews with Smythe and Faison, recorded 1997. Both describe their former functions. Yeah. For me, a wonderful example of the quality of oral history. ALIU, Art Looting Investigation Unit of the OSS, that sounds really very elaborated. And after having read and studied a lot of documents in the archives, you know a lot about this organization. But for me, I can say um, only with the memories of Eslin Faison, I got an idea how and under which condition this group worked. Um, James Blot and Theodore Russo wrote reports on the Göring art lootings and the Einsatzstab Rosenberg, and Faison wrote uh, the report on the Linz Museum project, on the Linz collection from Adolf Hitler. And in my research in the archives, I have been quite worried about the fact that I found only the reports number one and two by Plot and Russo, and the number four by Faison, but I've never found a report number three. So I asked Faison and I got this answer. I quote, don't ask me the number three report. I don't even know what it is. It doesn't exist, so don't worry. They are one, two, and I'm four, and there's that wonderful mystery, what is three? So that's the background. <laughs> As member of the ALIU, Eslen Faison was a um, member of the OSS, so he was not part of the MFAA first, but he joined the section when he became a director of the collecting point in Munich, 1950, from 1950 to 1951. And there was one thing that happened in this period Faison was very angry about. It was the fact that he had the order to give the unidentified leftovers of CCP to Austria. Please hear how he described this situation. Yeah, I'm still worried about Austria. Faison told this story not only to me in this interview, but also, um, as I could see, on many other occasions. In Germany, in the 50s, in a newspaper article, he to have baked a Linzer Torte with his decision. But I'm sure that was not the reason for his anger. I'm convinced there was another reason, so as, as he told it in the interview. The decision to bring these artworks, the so-called Münchner Restbestände, to Austria was the complete opposite to the mission of the Monuments Branch, in which Faison definitely believed. The mission to find the art and return it return it to those countries or people to whom it belonged before. You find this narrative not only in my interview with Faison, you can find it in a lot of other memoirs of um, A officers. And to bring the stories together now, it's the same narrative I've pointed out before for the Monuments Man movie. And I would say in this point, the film is really very close to history. Let me show you one more last extract of the interview for this. So let me finish with the last sentence to our topic of provenance research. Looking precisely at the work of the MFAA branch helps us to understand better the conditions and scopes of actions they had. The work of the Allied Monuments Section, especially the foundation and administration of the collecting points after the end of the war, was the beginning of modern provenance research. It was not only done by Allied officers, but with the help of local and national art institutions. Their work and their knowledge was suddenly interrupted with the end of the Allied collecting point work. Neither Germany nor Austria continued the activities until it was Washington principles 
in Austria, maybe before the Mauerbach auction, the confiscation of the Schiele paintings and the restitution law of 1998. And in Germany, at least the Schwabinger Kunstfund in 2013, that reactivated the debates and activities on provenance research and restitution. But these activities, and we shouldn't forget that, started right here in Munich in 45. Thank you. I'm Maske. I am the managing archivist of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and like my colleague from the Met, Christelle Force, I'm playing the role of filling a place in the program that um, Lynn Nicholas would have held. She, at this point, would be uh, providing response to the uh, discussions, the, uh, the excellent papers that you've heard. Um, put on the spot this quickly, I'm not quite ready to uh, respond directly to them, but I'm happy to have this opportunity to uh, contribute to the program, just some brief remarks about connections between the Monuments Men uh, and my institution, the Met. Um, I'll also direct your attention to some future projects uh, at the Met that will highlight the Monuments Men and the work of restitution. Um, and finally, I'll share some observations of my own as an archivist um, uh, from a professional point of view on the work of the Monuments Men. Um, it's long been a point of pride at the Met that several leading staff of the museum have served as monuments men and women, and you've now uh, seen uh, the images of, of all of them that I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about now. Edith Standen, uh, who a longtime textile curator at the Met, um, who from 1945 to 47 helped to direct uh, and lead restitution work at the Wiesbaden Collecting Point. Um, she lived into the 1990s and also uh, recorded an oral history interview uh, with the Met uh, late in her life and was remarkably modest about her role um, in, in this phase of her career. Um, Theodore Rousseau, who you saw in one of the images just a second ago, uh, was a longtime European paintings curator at the Met who uh, served in the Art Looting Investigation Unit and was part of the team uh, that you just heard described that interrogated Nazi officials and collaborating dealers about looted art. Um, after the war, he returned to the Met um, and continued to curate European paint, uh, paintings and uh, died in the early 1970s in the position of chief curator of, of the institution. Um, Francis Henry Taylor uh, was the director of the Met from 1939 uh, until uh, about 1950 um, and uh, was part of the United States-based Roberts Commission and contributed to the effort in, in that regard. Develop and plan our Cloisters uh, Museum in Upper Manhattan, uh, and um, was a uh, you know field officer of the Monuments Men on the ground in France, and um, was as we saw one of the earliest contacts with Rose Valland, uh, also one of the first Monuments Men into Germany in the spring of 1945, and was one of the first to inspect and secure the uh, Nazi art repository uh, Neuschwanstein Castle. Um, after the war, he returned uh, and continued to serve as a curator, but later became director of the Met, uh, a position he held until his uh, unfortunate early death in 1966. Um, uh, Rorimer was always very proud of his service as a monuments man, um, and after his death, his family, uh, his, his uh, wife, who also worked at the museum, his uh, two children and his grandchildren uh, have um, always been in touch with the museum, and when the uh, the film was released or was even in production, um, members of the family continued to turn up new archival material uh, in the family apartment not far from the museum uh, that they donated to the Met. Um, and uh, for me as the archivist, that was a, a really wonderful connection to, to have with the family. Um, so among the archival holdings at the museum that I oversee are documents um, related uh, to the work of all of uh, their service uh, of, of these four uh, important.
uh, office files as director of Francis Henry Taylor, um, and that uh, corresponds with his period uh, of work on the Roberts Commission and does include some material related to, uh, to his work there. Um, this is a big milestone for the Met. We have digitized some archival collections, um, but this will be the first time we have made available online uh, the complete office files of any of our directors. So it's, it's a big milestone, and it's, it's wonderful that Taylor is the first, uh, and I hope that we'll um, follow that up with working on Rorimer's next. Secondly, uh, in the year 2020, the Metropolitan will be celebrating its 150th anniversary. Um, and there will be a large-scale uh, exhibition that will trace the entire history of the institutions collecting uh, over that 150 years. Um, but I'm very pleased that one of the galleries um, will focus on the monuments men and restitution work and will feature uh, artworks that are now in the collection that were restituted in the post-war period and later uh, were acquired by the museum um, and will be supplemented with archival material um, from uh, the papers of uh, the monuments, men and women, that I just uh, mentioned. Um, I'll close my remarks now by just noting, for me as an archivist by profession, one of the most inspiring aspects of the monuments men's work was the recovery and securing of documents and archives that remain vital to restitution efforts uh, to this day. MFAA, the last uh, A is for archives. And from the vantage point of this uh, 21st century, um, I think James Rorimer's recovery of um, Nazi uh, ERR records at Neuschwanstein are uh, among his greatest accomplishments. Um, and it rarely turns up in the pictures, or the photographs that we see. We see the paintings moving into the collecting point, but uh, voluminous records that the Nazis had kept there uh, came as well. Um, Rorimer himself recognized this at, in the moment of uh, discovery on May 4th, 1945, when he first entered the castle with a small group of American troops. Um, and in his first military report about the depot, which is now available online through the U.S. National Archives, uh, he wrote, quote, the documents, catalogs, and photographic negatives of the ERR can be the nucleus for the work of restitution of works of art. Um, I believe that many of my colleagues uh, here in the room today who have used this uh, archival material will agree, will agree with uh, James Rormer's prediction of the 70 years uh, that followed. Thank you. Um, we're going to be um, very brief, so please the middle seat, and Margarete Schweiker Wilhelm will also join in, let's say, moderating the discussion, or taking photographs, okay, whatever. Um, so, I have only one question, <clears throat> let's say, among the podium first, and then because we have um, an audience with so many different experts, so I would like to open this up for the audience to engage. And my question to the four um, panelists here would be, do you have any questions among yourselves or comments onto each other's um, presentation? If so, this is the moment. Well, then, um, is this on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's on. Uh, well, then I would start um, just a little comment um, on your uh, presentation. Yeah, well, uh, regarding um, to being um, just in the perspective to honor women in this uh, mm -hmm. yeah, section, um, I remember that in the movie when the presentation was held uh, with George Clooney, um, um, in front of the president and stuff with all the looted art and destroyed art works. It was actually, um, yeah, presented by Agnes Morgan, like Nicholas Lynn, uh, Lynn Nicholas, excuse me, um, wrote in her book. So I just thought that would be nice to mention that actually a woman held the presentation and not the man in the movie. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. Something else? To add? Um, something to add to Rose Mom. I really love the scene you showed <laughs> when she's in prison and she's really skeptical. What do you want with our stone? Do, do you want to steal our stolen art? And yeah. this is really what, 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 what is. The best sentence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think so too. And this is really something with Rose Baron. I, I worked in my thesis on the years she spent in Germany till 1954. Nobody talks about this time. So she's, she's known as the great spy, but nobody talks about her really, what she did even in the times in the 60s and 70s. And um, this, this critical and skeptical look in her eyes in the film is really something I can, I can uh, see in all the documents I've seen in, in German archives, that it was not easy working with that woman. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was also a great job Kate Blanchett did. So she was a wonderful actor for uh, Rose Vallon. I just have to add, when uh, when I had this interview with um, Eslan Faison, it was one of the first things he mentioned. Uh, did you read the book of Rose Vallon? Do you know Rose Vallon? She is the most important figure in all this, uh, in, in this story. So uh, I think he had, yeah. Okay. I'll just add that, uh, again, speaking with um, James Romer's children and grandchildren, they thought it was hilarious that Matt Damon was playing, uh, <laughs> playing their father, grandfather. No, no resemblance there. Uh, they were endlessly amused by that and by the, by the love scene also. <laughs> And I, I, I reassure that um, I, I've seen that too, that for the American and British monuments man, Rose Vallon was very important. And in the German archives, she's hardly mentioned at all. So it's only in the cases that really there was a fight for restitution or she wanted to see some archival documents. But nevertheless, she on her own had a huge amount of documents, but didn't want to let any German look into those documents. So she, she gathered her knowledge and really fought for it. Mm -hmm. I would, um, I, yes? Um, one thing though that the film doesn't really, one thing that the film doesn't really do well is, is represent Rose Vallon uh, as I think she was, like they make her way more glamorous than she was. She she was more much more mousy, which I don't consider a negative thing. But but let's face it, she was into the research and the facts, and she worked behind the scenes. She had no interest in you know being just yeah being on the stage, being at the forefront of anything. But she was working hard in the background always, and that's where she was efficient. And so and and. Her presence is all over the archives in France, the, the archives of the Commission de Récupération Artistique. She's all over those archives. And you can tell just from looking at the documents that all she wanted to do was look at the list and double check things and making sure like this has been restituted, this is here, this is, and, and that is what we do. And it's not about movies. I'm sorry. It's, it, and it's not all that glamorous all the time. No, not that glamorous, but maybe she, maybe the best scene for that was when she enters the, the empty room when Rory puts uh, the picture back on the wall and she just says, uh, well, um, I'm a spy, remember? So that she's everywhere without even somebody that recognized her. So. I, I thought it was a, a wise choice to focus on narrative structures mm -hmm. and not to do what is called, what you call reality yeah. check. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, this is, in a, in a sense, that is clear from the beginning, that it's a different layer of, let's say, telling a story, a film story. And my personal really uh, strange and bit awkward experience was when it was the premiere in um, Germany during the Berlinale in 2014. Um, I was sitting there, the first time screening, in beside um, two Spanish film critics. So one was Spanish, the other was Argentine. And one of them was laughing all the time, thinking this was an absolutely ridiculous film. The other one was sobbing because he was so moved. So I was sitting between the two. This is, let's say... Well, I, 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 was, I, was, I was taking notes. I was doing the reality check, of course. Um, no, but, um, but this is, let's say, the, the in-between that, um, that we are uh, looking at. Uh, but, but it is a, a legacy we have to, let's say, face and we have to be aware of in doing this kind of German-American uh, province research work. So um, I would like to open up the, um, the discussion to the, to the audience. Is there anything you would like to remark, to add on, um, 
anything particular or if you have something. So this is the moment to talk, to discuss. Simon Goodman, please. And I have one more hand over there and another one there. That's good. Uh, thank you. Hi. Um, thank you all for wonderful presentations. Um, I mean, there's a lot I could say, but I'll just say one thing. It's very sad that Lynn Nicholas couldn't make it, but she did include in her presentation uh, the first painting I ever discovered, which is 23 years ago, the Dugar landscape, which I found in Chicago. I just want to add that it's because of Ors Vallon that I found that painting, because um, she gave my father the negative photo of that picture at the end of the war. And I found the negative in my father's painting, uh, sorry, papers when he died. And so 23 years later, I found a lot more, but it all starts with Ors Vallon. So um, she's very much a real hero as far as I'm concerned, because she risked life and limb taking those pictures probably at night when the, when, the Ger when the rest of the Germans had gone home at the Jodbom before that painting was shipped to Switzerland, you know, and then ended up in the States. And uh, if I can ask another question, a more yeah. practical one. Um, the Monuments Men obviously did an incredible job, but I didn't hear mention the fact that they're disbanded actually, at the, you know, towards the end of 1946. They only really have a year to, in which to do their job. And most of the art workers, I'm aware, was actually returned to countries and not individuals. Mm. And then after that, I, I'm very curious, maybe one of you knows the answer, what happens to what wasn't returned? I mean, as far as I know, the local German authorities, which would be in the occupation uh, government, takes over the collecting point from 46 to whenever it closes, um, mm -hmm. I think it stays open until 54. Um, no, on, um, oh. it's um, collecting point is, is 49, then you have a two-year two, two year phase yes. minister-president, and then it's um, mm. the Treuhand Verwaltung für Kultur. All right, yes. Well, I'm just wondering, is much return during that? You know, they have much longer to, mm. you know, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what happens after the monuments men have to go home? <laughs> Any of you want to respond? That opens a discussion. <laughs> I think it, each country um, did handle it on, on yes, uh, state, yeah. in, in, in Munich. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's better for a Christian Fuhrmeister with the answer. I don't think we have uh, figures and numbers. Where's Iris? Um, do, do we Uh, the English translation will appear in November, so I extend it all uh, about all this. So the trusteeship of artworks existed until uh, 62, and after 62, so there were several uh, things happening to the artworks which had not yet been um, restituted. Um, and so th this is a long story. Maybe I, I, to, to make the long story short, <laughs> they are still existing, um, about 2,000 um, art, uh, items existing in the um, trusteeship of the German federal um, uh, government. And uh, they, uh, these items have uh, been um, researched. Uh, they did not. Yes, yes, okay, uh, 2,000 paintings plus uh, uh, other yeah. um, uh, graphic works, for example. And, uh, okay. Yeah, and, and that so was exactly, and, and you can before find we that came on, here, on their website. Um, at the Bavarian State Painting Collections, we looked at those objects that are given, that are, so to speak, the reminders of that, which are then BADV and today BVA Bundesverwaltungsamt, which is that's the CCP leftovers giving on loan to German museums, and they are investigating that right now. So this is ongoing work. Now I have um, Ulrike schmigel richtig von Wiesbaden, then Volker Deppkart, next. Um, I would like to come back to the, to the film and, and the narrative. I, I, I would like to, to point to the fact that we have to see the film in the broader uh, framework of American memory and commemoration of Second World War. It's, yeah. it's quite a pattern to have this 
the topic of emission, the topic of comradeship, the topic mm. of um, victory in the end. Mm. So that goes from like 46 to mm. nowadays, and I just mentioned like saving you, you private Ryan. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it, I, I didn't want to put it like that, but I, I think the, 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 the reason why I want to point to this is it's, it's quite a danger for us to become part of this narrative. Uh -huh. Um, okay. and, and well, because of expectations that were brought to us or are brought to us and our reaction to media all the time, mm -hmm. politics, um, this is all becoming a cliche. Mm -hmm. And I want to make another point. We were talking about um, heroes and heroism. We have just not even half of all the heroes that were there actually during the Se Second World War. I. Nobody ever is talking about the Russian museum people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is my very special topic, as Christian Fuhrmeister knows. And nobody ever talks about the Polish, and nobody ever talks about uh, the Yugoslavian, and so on and so on. I read my book. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you yeah. did. Um, yeah. No, Lynn Nicholas did too. Lynn Nicholas did too. But nobody else does. Well, not, not even Sakurov does. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> we still tend to forget that. Um, okay. May I have a short, short answer? I'm very happy that you mentioned that with the narrative and that's this typical uh, pattern of, of American uh, war movie. And I didn't mention um, this, um, yeah, it's a, a little bit like a Cold War movie. It's it's old-fashioned in this way. Yeah? So you have this ending with uh, uh, who's the first in Aussie, the Russians or we. Yeah, And uh, so I agree with you completely. And I don't want the, um, that we are so influenced by this narrative too. That's why I wanted to work out mm. it as a, as a narrative. Yeah. yeah. Understood. Uh, yeah. yeah I, that, I, I, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. He was first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly the uh, dynamics in the movie that I wanted to point to. I mean, you mentioned that this was some sort of a classical Hollywood war movie. Uh, but especially when you look at the group of monuments men, it's of course a transnational group of somehow representing the West, yeah. uh, liberal yeah. democracy, and they are pitted against the East. Yeah. I mean, in the end, it's mm. about protecting yeah. the art against the Russians, just like they had done before um, against, the, against the Germans. So it's the idea of somehow the West against totalitarian yeah. dictatorships. Uh, and so this is really a dynamics in the film that somehow goes beyond the classic all-American uh, fight for freedom because this creates the transnational community of liberal Westerners protecting art against totalitarianism. The funny thing is, you're perfectly right, I believe, but when asked this question at the press conference in Berlin, Clooney said, political film? Of course not. We just wanted to do a fun movie. So this is, let's say, the, ho uh, the Hollywood c answer to, 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 to this analysis and differentiation, as you put out. Jane. Yeah, no, I just wanted to mention for um, the German audience that's here that Lynn Nicholas, it is really unfortunate, so many levels, she couldn't be here, but I had the pleasure of sitting next to her at the screening, and she had written an article for the Wall Street Journal the day before without having seen the film. And I said, Lynn, it's so strange, every example in the journal that you state in the movie, and she goes, yes, because so much of it came from my book. So I just want to say yeah. that not only that, Lynn also worked with the National Endowment for Humanities on a very outstanding documentary called The Rape of Europa. So I would say that if anybody watches the film, anybody who tells me this, I encourage them to go see it because even as a museum curator, I'll never forget Nancy Yadi from the National Gallery, Lynn Nicholas, and um, Corey Wagner, my colleague who's doing cultural recovery, were talking about what was going on in Iraq, in Iran, and um, the looting in Afghanistan and so forth. And seeing this uh, documentary part and hearing them talk about it, you can convey the complexity of the situation, and it is covered in Lynn's book. It was just very unfortunate. She was not even consulted during the movie. So you have to understand that um, Edsel really borrowed and learned a lot from Lynn, and he did hire mm -hmm. people to do research. But it wasn't like that early research, which kind of goes back to something that Christelle Force from the Met has talked about a lot about authorless provenance research. And so, you know, not all research is equal, and definitely we now know no all films are definitely not equal. Okay. So um, we have a little bit more time. Yes, please. 
Hi, thank you all for your presentations. They were incredibly interesting. And I'm just a layperson, so congratulations on that. Um, I love the documentary, The Monuments Men, and the book by Robert Etzel. And it broke my heart that they ruined, you know, the, the use of the Monuments Man with such, well, cliche. You know, it really did. I was so upset watching the movie because I, it was wasted. An amazing story was turned into a buddy, you know, movie. Let's have a beer and, you know, sing Christmas carols. I mean, my goodness. Anyway, sorry. I just had to get that out. Yes. What do we have to add? Um, okay. Oh, Laurie Stein, please. Welcome to Munich. <laughs> I just wanted to say that if we take the theme of camaraderie, which was brought up in one of the talks, I think that this discussion and remembering the movie and remembering the Monuments Men and asking the questions if, in fact, this is, you, you know, how much do you cover who else was contributing to the issues of finding and saving art at that time, just kind of brings us to a very nice conclusion of why we're here today. That if you look at the camaraderie that was necessary in those days, what's very important is the people who were monuments men and the people who were working with them in different countries, that's because they knew a lot about the collections. They knew the art, they knew the museums, they knew the historical monuments, and they had a network already of people who they could talk to in order to be able to protect these things and save these things and restitute these things. And I guess that if you want to look at what's going, what the PrEP program is about today, one can say that we're trying to bring together everyone to talk and have some of that dialogue and continue the work in that vein. So I just wanted to say thank you for starting out the program with such an appropriate beginning. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and actually, I also wanted to, bringing up this topic of comradeship, I mean, there is also, let's say, contemporary historians' research from Klaus Teweleit to Thomas Kühne, which is about violence. And actually, this raises a point that I never thought about uh, myself, because you do have, let's say, the German military art protection, Kunstschutz. So, do we have comradery there? I would rather tend to say no, not to the same degree. I'd rather see them as, see them as individuals, also competing with each other within the NS system, and not really to the same degree forming a team. So actually, this thinking about also, because this there is the transnational element of cultural heritage protection in itself, so that is something goes beyond provenance research, of course, but we could also, um, let's say, go into that um, venue, please. I just wanted to add um, a couple of more points, uh, which is that uh, we, the, the Clooney movie, for one, um, really insists on, on, I mean, shows us, what is it, like six of them or eight of them? There were, I believe, 345 Monuments Men. They're all listed on the Monuments Foundation, Monuments Men Foundation website. Um, and so that's one thing. Uh, of course, they didn't work all together. They worked in, uh, you know, they, their missions were siloed, but there were many of them. And the other point I want to, to make is that um, the vast majority of them worked for museums before and after. I know we've, we've mentioned that, but I think we need to insist on that because PREP is a um, provenance research exchange program for museum professionals. And I think it is very important to underline that, that, that fact that this whole um, restitution effort was always essentially connected to museums, to public collections, and uh, to the public good. And this idea of um, restitution is also mm. this, this connected to the idea that uh, it's not personal um, possession. It, it's no. about restitution to whom the art belongs. And anyway, so I thought. This strikes an interesting tone. And I think if I don't see any 
further hands right now. I would say thank you very much for this, um, let's say, great closing remark. And we, you are all invited for a reception right now. Am I right? Yes, um, um, in, the, in the other room over there. So please um, stay with us and um, continue to, to engage in discussions about this very um, interesting topic. Thank you very much for coming.